Uh, well, we're continuing on today in Ecclesiastes. We uh, started off last week talking about uh, the essence of life. Uh, the theme was everything is futile. We discussed kind of the awkwardness of that and how it's kind of strange for a sermon title. But I think we really dug deep and, and uh, got into uh, the heart and the, the meat of the matter. And I think in a, in a lot of ways it's a very challenging philosophical, theological task to really look at uh, the truth of how things are. Uh, I, I find that in life we deal with the surface issues a lot. You know, it's kind of like vacuuming the carpet with a really bad vacuum and all it really does is pick up the stuff on the top. It doesn't really get inside the carpet or in the pad, you know, where all the nasty things really are. And so what you have after that is this really nice looking carpet that looks great on the outside, but on the inside there's like dust mites and fleas and spills that have molded and, you know, it's kind of gross not to, you know, kind of weird anybody out. But uh, that's what our lives are like a lot. You know, we just deal with all the surface issues and then we're just kind of nasty inside. And so we're trying to uh, not do that. We're trying to be that high-quality vacuum cleaner that really gets the, the rot out. And, and if necessary, we're going to take our utility knife and we're just going to cut out the carpet and tear it up and start over. Sometimes that's what it takes. So if you would turn with me to chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, we went through the first two chapters. And as often is the case, uh, there are not enough Sundays in the year uh, there's only like 52 or so, and so it's somewhat limiting. Uh, so we can't go through every chapter verse by verse, which is kind of what I'd like to do. So I would ask you to fill in the gaps outside of our time on Sunday afternoons uh, with some of the things that we skip over. But we're going to try to touch on uh, the really important uh, items, and particularly things that aren't re repetitive. Uh, because if you notice anything about Solomon, a lot of times he'll kind of go back and say something in a different way. Um, for you know, because we all hear things differently and learn things differently, and that's great. And so, but we will not cover that. We will kind of move forward from that. And again, uh, if you're interested or want to, and I, I hope you are interested, I hope you do want to, you can kind of go back and fill in some of those things. Now, today's subtitle, "The Mystery of Time," is a little bit more exciting. It's a little bit more okay. We're not going to quit before we get started. So, so that's good. And we're going to dive right into there being a, a season for everything. Now, for those Trekkies of you out there, uh, you'll note that in the late 1990s and New Millennia era, there was a whole series of Star Trek books, and they were actually based off of this chapter in Ecclesiastes. And they were all titled a different thing, you know, uh, time to give birth and time to die, and different things. And so they actually took that from the Bible, which is kind of shocking and unusual, uh, but, but awesome, but good. And so uh, we're going to revisit some of those things and take a look at them. And for many of us, it's going to be a struggle because we don't think in those terms. How we think is this. It's Monday. I'm looking at my calendar. 8 o'clock, I have this. At 9 o'clock, I have this. At 10 o'clock, I have this. At 12 o'clock, I have this. At 2 o'clock, I have this. Boom, 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 boom. We go from thing to thing to thing. If someone asks us if you can get together and do something, what's your first response? I don't know. Let me look at my calendar. And so wherever mine is... Oh, it's tucked in here with the microphone cord. We pull it out, look at the calendar, and figure out if you even have time to do something with somebody. Okay, it's totally ridiculous. I don't know how it happened, how we got this way. It is, by the way, not that way almost everywhere else in the world that you go. I have been to Central America. I've been to Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Polynesian islands, all over the world. And with the exception of like the really, really big metropolis cities, everyone else is just kind of like, well, we'll probably do that around 10. And that means like at 11, it'll go. You know, it's like, well, we'll do that on Friday. And so it's, there's, it, you know, when ask when on Friday, because it's just kind of whenever you show up to do it. All right. So there's probably a balance between those two extremes where everything is just rigidly it has to be at this time it has to be you have so many minutes you know i love it whenever i go to the doctor or the dentist or you know some appointment and it's like you can tell when your time's up you know it's like all of a sudden it's like okay well i'm glad we talked i hope you have a great day we'll see you later when you know start scheduling the next appointment it's kind of like okay great you know it's just i've been politely asked to depart now and so it's it's a struggle for us to even begin to consider that we might have to wait that, we might, that there might not be uh, a, a time for a specific task or thing that we want to put on the clock at 1 o'clock or 4 o'clock or we're going to do this at, on Wednesday at, 
at 1 p.m. And, and, and I struggle with that too. You know, in my world, everything is just, we're doing this, and then we're doing this, and we're doing that. And if one thing gets messed up, my whole day or week is, is totally annihilated because there was only X amount of time, and when, once something goes over, something else is going to pay the price. But the Bible in, in Solomon, as he's teaching us uh, through the great wisdom that God has given him, is teaching us that there is a time for everything. All right? There is a time to do things. There is a time not to do things. And that we are not the masters of time that we want to be. That we ultimately are not and should not be in control of when things happen. Now, if you have ever done uh, any farming or gardening, uh, or you've tried to raise uh, you know, livestock or pets or something, then this lesson is taught to you the very hard way. All right? Whenever you feel like it is time for your potatoes to come up, or it's time for your... You know, I don't know, whatever kind of flowers you might have, or, uh, that, that the ground does not care what your schedule is. <laughs> okay, have you, guys, have you guys experienced this phenomenon? The ground does not care, okay? Uh, when, the, when the raccoons come to eat your ducks, or when the possums come to eat your chickens, they don't care whether or not you feel like it's time for them to die. It's just the, the nature of things. And we have to begin to accept and even embrace and live in harmony with this idea that things happen at their own pace. That there is a time for everything, and rather than try to fight it and try to stuff everything into our calendar, into our mold, that we have to just accept the limitations of time, accept the limitations of what can be and cannot be accomplished. And so we begin our struggle today with the mystery of time, beginning Chapter 3, verse 1. There is an occasion for everything, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to, excuse me, throw stones, and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace, and a time to avoid embracing. A time to search, and a time to count is lost. A time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to be silent, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And so we are perplexed because for many of us, we struggle not with this reality. I don't think there's anything particularly shocking in here that we're just, oh, I didn't know there was a time for that. But it's more of an issue of we don't know when to do what. That seems to be where we really struggle. Because there, are, just like in the seasons of planting and harvesting, that can't be done any time. You know, if you go out in the dead of January when it's 10 degrees outside and you plant, or if you plant in mid-October and go to reap a harvest in December, it's going to end badly, either with nothing or dead nothings on the ground. And so there's a, a right time. And for many of us, we have a really hard time. Now, I, I will... Uh, deposit in this conversation, one of the reasons why we struggle with that is because the media and commercials and advertisements are, are, are always sending us this one message. Time's running out. You have to buy this now, do this now, have this now, or else your whole life, and here's what they're saying kind of without saying it, your whole life's going to be a waste and you're going to live a tragically depressed and terrible life because you don't have this product. Or because you haven't, you know, tried out this subscription to whatever or, or you know, the, whatever it is they're trying to sell or, or get us to buy. And so we start to get nervous and, and, and when we go to school and our teachers tell us, oh, you need to get really good grades so you can grow up and get a good job. Because if you don't, your whole life's going to be terrible. And, and, and then, you know, just the list goes on and our, and our parents are putting pressures on us. And, and, and if, we, if we go to church and we come to church and we hear, okay, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. And all of a sudden it's just overwhelming and we just feel stressed out and frustrated and tired. And the problem isn't 
necessarily what our parents are telling us because usually they're, they're giving us wise counsel. It's not what we're learning at church because usually those are good biblical principles. It's not what our teachers are telling us because they're just trying to help us uh, to, to be the best that we can and to fulfill uh, the, the using of our abilities to the best that we can. But the problem is that sometimes we try to take on way too much. We become greedy and jealous and we want to have what everybody else has and we forget that there is a path, that there is a time of earning, of sowing, of preparing, of gathering. You know, notice a lot of these things that are in here, that there is both weeping and laughing. There, are, there is birth, there is death, that all of those things are a part of our life. Now, for some of us, we have this um, temptation to go to one of two extremes. Okay, it's the half empty glass, half full glass syndrome. All right, we either think that everything's great, and no matter how bad it is, it's still great, and we're kind of living in the clouds, and we don't want to come down to reality and accept the way things are so that we can deal with them. Or we're the other extreme where everything's terrible, and no matter how good it is, it's still terrible, it's never enough, it's always bad, it's always going to be bad, and so why even try, why even live, why even breathe? Because ultimately, we're just going to be miserable. Okay, and, and, and both of those are false. Those are, both of those extremes are examples of how we do not want to be. But rather, we are to be balanced, that we are to accept the limitations uh, that, that life has, that we cannot be everything to everyone. We cannot do everything and accomplish everything. Now, for some of you, that's not a big deal. All right? For some of you, that's like, okay, duh, let's move on. I get it. But for those of you who are a little bit like me and you're a little bit overdriven and you are that person that, that is, wants to push the, the nuclear launch button because you just it's red and just looks cool and you just feel compelled to just do it because it's there, then we struggle a little bit with that. That, that we don't want to restrain ourselves. We just want to go out there and get it and own it and conquer it. We're pioneers. We are uh, uh, wanting to be larger than life, do more than what's possible. And so we end up either burned out, dead, frustrated, depressed, in jail, something undesirable, a place that we don't want to be. Because we weren't able to add balance to that. Let's go on in verse 9. So what does the worker gain from his struggles? Okay, and in, in this analogy, in this, because uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you look at some of the wisdom literature, a lot of times we are stereotyped as a certain participant in the story. Okay, so, so it's not talking about, you know, if you work at a certain profession or job. We are all workers. Okay, we're working at life. All right, we are working, we're toiling. So that's the, the context. And I make sure everybody establishes that. So no one is exempt from being a worker. Even if you are re resisting that, you are still a worker in life, whether you are actively participating or whether you're just kind of letting it hit you, uh, like the waves in the ocean. When you're standing there and you're, you're t you just want to be still and plant yourself in the wave, just keep hitting you over and over. Okay, there's, there's those of us who dive into the waves and those of us who let the waves hit us. But in this context, we're all workers. And the question is, then what do we gain? Those of us who are life livers, what is it that we gain from these struggles? Is the question. Verse 10, I have seen the task that God has given people to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate in its time. Now that's interesting to me, because that is a blanket statement. When we see the word everything, okay, that means that everything in life has its time has its place, has its purpose. The struggles, the hardships, the joys, the excitements. And so it, it is not necessarily God's plan for us to go from one high, from one exciting experience to the next. That there are steps backwards. That there are hardships that are placed upon us or are allowed into our lives so that we will be challenged, so that we will grow. And it is a healthy part of the process of life. Now, I have a hard time swallowing that pill, all right? That's like the giant multi -vi Have you ever, for, for those of you men that you may have not have seen these, but have you ever seen like a, a, a woman's prenatal vitamin? 
they're like this big, you know, they're pink, you know, they make some make it, and they're supposed to be coated like, tastes like chocolate or something to help you swallow it, but they are monstrously huge, and my wife just, I had a terrible time getting her to take her prenatal vitamins, because they give it, I was wondering, why don't you give just like three little pills, you know, why this monstrous horse pill, okay, you ladies are, know what I'm talking about. And, that, and those, those troubles, those problems that plague us in life, big and small, is like that giant prenatal vitamin that we just don't want to take. We're looking at that thing and we're going, no thank you. I do not care to have that at this time. But it is important. It's really important, uh, especially when those, those early, well, really in every month of, of pregnancy for a woman to have those extra vitamins because the baby's getting the best of the nutrients and if you don't take it, this is like an ad to take your prenatal vitamins, I guess, or something, I don't know. Um, but if you don't take that, then you are the one that suffers, all right? That's why a lot of times women who are pregnant, their teeth get really bad uh, or their skin gets really bad, and that's because that baby is getting all of the, the vitamins and the nutrients. That's why you need all that. And it's the same way in our lives, that when we go through the challenges of life, we have got to endure that hardship because if we don't, if we don't take that pill, then we're going to suffer. There's going to be a part of us that is going to be lacking. There's going to be a challenge that is coming that we will not be ready for if we don't take those steps that God has put in our life. And I've found in my life that God, He gives me just about the amount of pain and suffering that I can take at the time. And He teaches me and I go through that experience and I come out and I'm like, man, I'm so glad that's over. I really don't want to go through that again. And then pretty soon, life is great, and I'm going along, and all of a sudden, you know, and this huge problem comes up. And this one's a little bigger, a little longer, a little more challenging. And so I'm thinking, man, as I look back, if I hadn't gone through this, I could have never handled this. And so we have to, to look at those challenges, and I'm not trying to be pie in the sky and half full glass and be like, oh, you should love the challenges, embrace the challenges, pray for challenges. I mean, yes, you probably should do all those things, but that's pretty hard. So at the very least, we should uh, appreciate and respect that, the challenge and, and do our best to endure it and allow ourselves to be molded and changed so that we will be strengthened and hardened and ready for what is ahead. Let's continue reading. He has made everything appropriate in its time, and he has also put eternity in their hearts. Fascinating statement. But man cannot discover the work God has done from beginning to end. Okay, that's why it's a mystery, all right? Because we can't fully understand and comprehend God's plan in our lives, his plan for the world, his plan for all the parts of our life, our nation, our community, our church, that, that the, the ultimate and full disclosure, full details of that are a mystery to us, that only God knows and understands those things. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. Let's read, I want to read that part again. I know, this is Solomon, that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. It is also the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his efforts. Now let's think about that for a minute. Why would that be a gift? When we get to enjoy our efforts. Well, I want to tell you a story. A few of you guys know this story. Uh, back in the 1930s is during when our Great Depression was, which kind of triggered really ev everywhere else in the world into a, a, a Great Depression. It's a very difficult time, and we, we were having a pretty rough time here in the States. But in, in the uh, former Soviet states, it was much, much worse. And there was a, a, just like here, where we talk about the Dust Bowl, everybody know what, what I'm talking about with the Dust Bowl, is when we just had a, a, a very low amount of rain, not just for one year, but for several years in a row. And they called it the Dust Bowl because it got so dry that the soil actually just, just started kind of going up into the atmosphere. And it was just a, a terrible time for farming, for, for people that had livestock. And for us, it was just a severe hardship. But for many people that lived in other places in the world, it was a death sentence because there wasn't enough food to go around. And so uh, after the, the Bolshevik Revolution, when the communists took control of, of, the, so, of, the, of old Russia and then a lot of the surrounding uh, areas, including Ukraine, they would send the soldiers out into, into the farms. 
And at gunpoint, they would take all the food that the, the farmers had been working for, you know, all summer long. They would go out at harvest time and they would take all the food. Sometimes they would leave a little bit. Other times they would just take it all and leave that family to, to literally to starve or to get into winter with, with no food to eat. And, and millions, okay, and this is not like a foo-foo, you know, randomly saying, but literally millions of people died in Eastern Europe because of the severity of this uh, famine and because of the selfishness of, of that government who basically came and stole the people's food and starved them out. And so this, in, in, in knowing people whose parents and grandparents suffered through this tragedy, it brings a whole new idea to being able to enjoy our effort. Because, I mean, imagine working for something. Imagine having a family farm that you farm for generations, and all of a sudden, some people that are bigger and stronger than you come and take it all away. Or kill you if you get in their way of, of trying to harvest your crops, of trying to raise your livestock. And yet, that's what happens. And it happens in many, many places today. And so it is, a, it is truly a joy that, that we, especially in America, that we get to enjoy the fruit of our labor, that we go and work, and usually that paycheck is coming, and we, if we spend that money wisely, we can enjoy that. And that is a blessing, and, that, and, and I think it is important for us, especially in America, because we, we struggle to have a context for that. We struggle to understand the significance of that, that we are not slaves. And we talk, you know, we talk about how tough things are and how unfair some laws are and the government is, but, but really, truthfully, and this is not a campaign to act like everything's fine and we should just smile and be happy. I'm not saying that by any means. But we truly do have many things to be thankful for here. That we are not slaves. We can keep at least a portion of what we work for after we pay our taxes. And uh, we are blessed by that. Let's continue on. It is the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his efforts. And I know that all God does will last forever. There is no adding to it or taking from it. All right? In other words, we can't change or, or do something that is somehow going to surprise God or, or change his ultimate plan of redemption for humankind. That, that, that is set in motion and that trying to fight that and trying to, to rail against that is just a waste of time. It is a, an exercise in futility. So let's fast forward now to chapter 4. We're going to skip up to verse 7 where Solomon now turns and, and, he, and he's been dealing so far with us pretty well one-on-one -on -one personally. And now he's going to deal with us and our, our lot in this life as a group, all right, as people that, that it is better for us to work together, to be together, to, to live in fellowship, to help one another than to be alone and isolated. Again, I saw futility under the sun. And there is a person without a companion, without even a son or brother. And though there is no end to all his struggles, his eyes are still not content with riches. So who am I struggling for, he asks, and depriving myself from good? This too is futile and a miserable task. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. You know, let's pause there for just a moment. I realized that uh, rock climbing, at least in the modern sense, was not a sport uh, back in the Old Testament times. But it makes me think of that, how important it is to climb with a partner. Because if you fall and you're hanging there, there is no one to pull you up or to help you out of that situation. And we've heard a lot of stories of people crazy enough to climb by themselves, and they either plunged to the ground or hung themselves or you know, it ended badly. And uh, that's what I think of. But there's a lot of situations in life where it is so important to have somebody there. There's been a lot of times where I've kind of foolishly gone out uh, by myself into the pasture, you know, on the tractor or doing something, and I'm, I've gotten myself into a little trouble by myself, and uh, I, I remember my father-in-law telling me, be careful what you do on the tractor, you know, be careful what you're doing, you know, this and that, because uh, being raised in the city, I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time alone, and being a pastor in particular, I'm always with people, doing things with people, meeting people, so on and so forth, so I don't tend to think about those kind of things a lot. 
But in life, it is easy for us to be, and I think Annette or somebody, uh, or Deanna, said something about this earlier today, that we can be around people and we can be in a crowd, but still be alone, still be isolated. Because we're, we're, we're closed off, our heart is closed, our mind is closed, and we're just, we're just kind of like this with people. And we, we don't want to let them in, we don't want to let them help, we don't want to help them. In fact, it's funny, a lot of cultures, they, don't, they see help as a really negative thing. And it's not so much because they don't want to help, it's because they don't want to be called upon to help later. And so they just think, well, I'm not going to ask for help because I don't want to have to go help somebody. And it's this cycle of selfishness. And I see it in our own nation, in, nation, in our own culture, that we, we have become very isolated. We've become very selfish. It's all about us, what we want to do with our time, what we need. Forget everybody else. Forget working as a team. And I find it fascinating. Okay, fascinating. When I went to college, one of the biggest topics and the, one of the biggest changes in instruction, which and everyone hated it, and, and I don't know what it's like now, was that they taught team building skills. Okay, and before that, okay, before the 1990s, it wasn't really an issue because people tended to work together. It was just kind of a cultural trend. But all of a sudden here, now you've got these uh, uh, generation Xers, all right, my generation, all of a sudden we're kind of loners. We don't want to work with anybody. Uh, we don't want to cooperate with anybody. We don't want to dress like anybody or act like anybody. We're just like these big vigilante rebels, and it's just, you know, we're just going to dress the way we dress to be different, okay, just because we're rebelling against being different. And, uh, or rebelling against being the same. And so now, all of a sudden, we're having to teach team building skills, and so we're doing all these projects in teams, and we're working in teams, because we have trouble, and I think it's probably just gotten worse after our generation, we have trouble working together, to coming together to accomplish a task. And you know, it makes a lot of sense, because I think, I think about a lot of the great things that we did uh, in the last century. We put a man on the moon. Uh, we developed new technologies and medicines that, that have extended life by decades. And we have accomplished some amazing things together when people work together and they, they have a common goal and they're striving for something. But now we've kind of got into this existential postmodern time where everything is, is uh, uh, all, all about us and what our needs are and what we want and what's best for us. And we struggle now to work together as a team. But the Bible teaches us, and it's very clear, two are better than one. That when we work together, it's a lot better than we, when we work by themselves. We've had, um, and I've seen this a lot when we're building our house. We've got framers out there and really got two main guys. I kind of help them from time to time when I can. But uh, they need one another. Some of those TGIs and those big I-beams are really heavy. And uh, one guy, it doesn't matter if he's got five hours of time, he can't do what two guys can do in just a few minutes. You know, it's, it's just an amazing thing sometimes to watch teamwork, to watch people that have a common goal work together and, and the, what, the things that they can accomplish. Uh, when I was uh, in Ukraine the first time, I was so amazed at what such a small group of believers could do. Uh, when, and and I, I won't tell the whole story because um, I know I've told it before and, and we don't have time. But it is amazing to me how three brothers in 17 years can disciple a region that now has over 24 churches with hundreds of people having all been saved and come to, to serve the Lord and, be, and many who have become missionaries who have gone out of that region to see what a, a church and a group of believers working together can accomplish. It is amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. And it is equally frustrating and disappointing to see what profitability and what fruit is lost when we fail to work together. Also, going on in verse 11, Also, if two lie down together, they can, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And that's fascinating because in a lot of applications today, when, we, when there's wiring for things or rope that's, that's made or weaved or, or thread, fabric, that's, it's thread with at least three strands. 
because it's much stronger than two strands or one strand when they're threaded together. Even if you took them separately and you, you calculate the amount of weight that they can sustain when you use them together, they can multiply that exponenti exponentially. All right, we're going to fast forward to chapter 5. We're going to hit this and we will be done for today. Chapter 5, verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Better to draw near in obedience than to offer the sacrifice as fools do, for they ignorantly do wrong. And do, be, do not be hasty to speak. Do not be impulsive to make a speech before God, because God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. And I think there's actually a song that uh, came out here by Mercy Me or somebody a few years ago uh, that had those words in it. For dreams result from much work and a fool's voice from many words. And when you make a vow to God, don't delay in fulfilling it, because he does not delight in fools. Fulfill, fulfill what you vow. Better that you do not vow than that you vow and not fulfill it. And do not let your mouth bring guilt on you. And do not say in the presence of the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry with your words and destroy the work of your hands? For many dreams bring futility, and so do many words. Therefore, fear God. And of course, it was Solomon who said that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There's so many great truths and so, so many things to ponder on that we've discussed. I know that it, at times I, um, I struggle to have the desire to become better, to overcome sin in my life, to overcome pride, to overcome complacency. God is always pressing us to the next level. He is always pushing us. There is, there is no stagnancy for the follower of Christ. We can be stagnant if we're not followers. But if you, are, if you have made a commitment and you are serious about following Jesus, you are always on the move. You are always moving from one thing and to another because God does not tolerate stagnancy. It is not his plan or, or his will for us to just get to a certain place and just kind of stay there and never move forward from that. And today I want to, to challenge you. I want to simply just to ask you how serious you are about finding joy and fulfillment in life. Because ultimately that is the question. It's not really a question of how, what great things you can do for God or what you can accomplish in your life or how much money you can accumulate or how good you can become at doing a specific task because you know there will always be someone else who's better. Solomon said after, and we, we looked at this pretty closely last week, after all the struggles and toils and, and of experiencing every pleasure in life, his conclusion that ultimately the best thing that we can do is just to eat, drink, and be merry. Fear God, to love our fellow man, to work together as a team, to live in harmony, and to strive to accomplish His purposes. And if we are faithful and even attempting to do those things, that God will provide for us, that He will give us joy for that journey. Today, you are in one of two places. You are either in the midst of experiencing that joy, and no matter what you come up against, no matter how frustrating things become, you're just, you're okay, you're at peace, you're just, you're living life, you're living the dream. Or, every frustration and trouble that comes along is just like a new wave that just knocks you down. And you just keep hitting, by getting hit by wave after wave, and it just keeps knocking you down, and you just fall deeper and deeper into depression, anger, and frustration. And I want to invite you to stop the cycle today. Because it is your choice. You are allowing to, yourself to be caught up in that. And it can sound really super spiritual or strange to think, what I can, I can experience joy in the midst of a great tragedy, but it is the truth. My testimony in my life 
is that when I have humbled myself and when I have embraced those truths that, that God has brought joy into my life, even in the most desperate and troubling times. And He will do that for you. So let's pray together about this. God, I thank you that you have created a path, a journey, an existence in this life that is not hopeless, that there is not this big dark forest that's just going to swallow us up or we're going to be lost and troubled, but that no matter where we go or, or no matter how complicated things become, you can always reach into the thick of that disaster and you can pull us out. And you can bring us a clarity and a pureness of life where joy and contentment and peace reign. So God, right now, I pray for every man and for every woman in this room, for every child that is just discouraged and frustrated and ensnared by the temptations of the enemy, by the allure of wealth or status, are accomplishing things that can never be fulfilled. And I pray, God, that first that you would just help them to see that they are caught in that trap and that you would just throw a, a lifeline out to them, just pull them out of that. They would be up in the trees where they could look down and just see the, the troubles and the difficulties that you have delivered them from. And God, I pray for those very real, very tangible hardships and needs needs for marriages to be healed, needs for, for finances to be provided, needs for jobs and, and needs for problems with neighbors or friends or family where there's been a broken relationship and there's been a, someone's let someone else down and there's just resentment and frustration and anger for every difficulty that plagues us under the sun today. God, I pray that you would just help us not to be so caught up in those things that we couldn't see the big picture. God, I pray that you would deliver us today. I pray next week, Lord, as we go to the park, as we get outside of our safe church building and we worship you in public and we worship you in a place that is foreign to us, I pray, Lord, that, that we would be a light in the city of Ozark. I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, show us the people that we can bring, the people that we can invite this week. God, I pray that, that your word would not return void in us, but that we would be the living word that goes out from your mouth and is a, pierces the darkness like a, a powerful flashlight in the middle of the night or a, a lighthouse does over the dark of the ocean and of the waters. And that all of the rage and hate and darkness be made into goodness and light, not just in our small community, but all throughout the world. Lord, may your will be done, may it be accomplished according to your purposes. Lord, allow us to be a part of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today.